So we want to finalize the SOM. We just got to the last step, which is the rate updates, and yet we run out of time. So we talked about competition and collaboration. Competition by finding the minimum uh, distance, basically, and collaboration by using a neighborhood and sharing the weights. And the last step uh, would be then the weight update. Weight updates, which is for every neuron at the iteration n plus 1, I have to adjust the weight using what was before or what is now, plus a little bit of uh, change, delta wj. So uh, we will not go much in detail into this today because we still don't know um, the neural networks. But this will be the adjustment that is supposed to make many techniques intelligent. And so if you start with a synaptic value, which is between two connection between two things, usually two processing units, two neurons, whatever. And if I cannot adjust that, there is no movement. There is no progress. There is no uh, learning. So learning is basically adjusting the weights. And the way that S1 does it is quite straightforward. It uses the, a factor eta that we call learning rate, and then the, in, the output times the input minus a function g of the output yj, y sub j, times the weights. OK, that's a little bit too much. So this part is the based on Hebb's rule. And this part people call well, forgetting rule. And the Hebb rule, well, th this is just a constant, uh, that we need a constant to control the level of adjustments. We get to that. So, But the fact that if you have something going into a synopsis and going out from the other side, so this is what Hebb's established and is formulated in the general rule that fire together, wire together. So that's the basic principle of Habs. Fire together, wire together, which means you can implement it in many different ways. But basically, if you get the uh, pro product of in and output, pre-synaptic, post-synaptic, that should give you that growing together. What OK, don't, don't panic. We get back to this. We, we want to do this from scratch when we get to the perceptron. So if you do this, so th this, this g of y sub j, this part, is simply a def the eta factor, the learning factor times the output y sub j. So just. And we can, we can say, what is that? Again, this, this factor times our neighborhood function. So you take a weighted value of the neighborhood function that you were supposed to control your collaboration. So if I take that, so this is the neighborhood function that we talked about before. So to, to what extent? So the neighborhood times the weight. So am I sharing generously or I am sharing greedily? So that's up to us. So that value, which is, again, a number between 0 and 1, so we'll decide how much of the weight is being shared. Or you forget about it, not shared. So we can completely then write this, the, the updating rule the wj at the iteration n plus 1 is w sub j at n, 
So you always take the value, whatever it was, and then we want to update it. Then we have the eta, which could also be a function of iteration. That learning rate. So whatever, whatever you want to add or subtract or whatever you want to do, whatever change you want to make, I want to have a little bit of control. Of course, eta is between 0 and 1. So I want to control. Maybe I don't want to make a lot of changes, so eta will be towards 0. Maybe I want to make a lot of changes, then eta goes toward 1. So we want to have control above that. And ideally, that control should be a function of time. Because at the beginning, we want to make a lot of changes. And toward the end, we don't want to make changes. Because you could easily destroy whatever you have learned toward the end by making big changes. So toward the end, you should not make many changes. So eta to, uh, uh, of n times this h sub ij of x also at n. Now I put also x as the subscript. So the, member, the neighborhood function is also a function of time. And as we said at the beginning, you are very generous, and then you get greedy, greedy, and do not share weights with anybody anymore. Times, so because I put brought eta here, now I'm taking it out, times x minus the weights, whatever they are at the time n. And this becomes a pattern that we repeat that any value that we use has an initial value. And then we use some sort of exponential decay function minus n over, let's say, another constant t sub 2. Again, this is another constant that we are using. And for this, you can go, for example, uh, eta sub o is, let's say, 0 0.1 at the beginning, t2 could be 1,000, and t1 from before, the another exponential decay function that we had is, let's say, 1,000 over log of the standard deviation, the initial standard deviation. And that, that has to be, that has to be big enough. OK, I'm throwing at the beginning of lecture a lot of material at you, I know. So <laughs> take it easy. We, we get into this. I want to get rid of SOM because that, I was handicapped with SOM. We have not talked about neural network, and I have to talk about SOM as a clustering technique. So we are talking about neural network without knowing neural network. So. We come back to this. We will revisit this. We establish it for perceptron. We will talk about Hebian rule. We will talk about generalized Hebian rule and all that. So for the time being, all I want you to understand is this, that learning is doing adjustments. And determining the amount of adjustment requires a lot of effort. So and that, that goes back to HAP. So we, all the time we are using some notion of Hebbian rule. And that Hebbian part may be difficult for us to understand. We get to that. And you bring in some specific type of learning that you are incorporating, in our case, neighborhood to bring a balance between competition and collaboration. The rest is just playing. So I need something to control, uh, eta, alpha, beta, whatever. And I need it to be a function of time. Of course, it cannot be constant. So I want to be more generous at the beginning, more conservative at the end. So all that. And of course, everything goes back to this difference. So as, as soon as, as long as we understand that, OK, we put, the, we had some discussions last uh, lecture, at the la, uh, no, last lecture with some of you. So again, SOM is constraint k-means. And what is constrained is the location of the averages and the means. So they are fixed. And we let the weights go around and be adjusted to the inputs. And that's another type of clustering, basically. OK. So what are, what are the issues? So for example, when we talk about the convergence of such a technique, you, 
if, if you don't understand it at all, just forget about this. Forget about the second term and just look at this. So we are, we are weighting the product of in and output, presynaptic and postsynaptic. But just keep it there. I, I, being confused for two weeks uh, is not a big deal. We get to know all networks and then we will revise this. So uh, how, how do we converge? Well, you need many iterations. We need many iterations to converge. So n has to be a large number. So this n has to be a large number. How many? Well, depending on your data. Give me something. Well, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000? Depends. How difficult is the problem? Uh, generally, for example, we are talking about several thousand times, several thousand times. Several thousand times the number of units. Well, that's a rule of thumb. The number of units. So you have 100 neurons several thousand times time 100. So 100, 100 neurons, 100,000. Wow, that's a lot. So that, that's, a, that's an approximate. There is no formula for that. Just to give you an idea, the bigger the map grows, you, mere, you need more iteration to, to converge. OK. How do I stop? How do I stop? Well, I can stop if there is no noticeable change. If you see that your delta w's are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, there's nothing you're not making significant changes anymore, then you stop. <clears throat> so, or no noticeable, which means basically no big change in the feature map. And yes, we call, we call uh, self-organizing maps also feature maps because they try to be like features, the inputs. So we call them feature maps. What problems do we have with SOMs? I was complaining that they are being ignored. Maybe they have some issues. That's the reason that people don't use them. Well, generally convergence may take a, convergence may, may take a long time. And the bigger problem, so the problem I have observed with SOM, is that you get variable results. That's a much bigger problem. So that means if you run SOM three times, you get three times three set of different clusters. It will not always give you the same clusters. Why is that? Well, because you are not telling me the number of clusters, and I'm supposed to figure it out, so it's not that easy. So there are different variations of SOM uh, that I may put some link into that, that you look at extensions of SOM. One of the things that I did in practice to get rid of this problem, that if you run SOM three times, you get three times, three different set of clusters. So what I did was you run n times, you get n clusters, and then you merge. So you see how many times these two, these two elements were in the same cluster. OK, they belong to the same cluster. Put them here. So you can, you can do tricks like that to get rid of it, but that's, that's, a, that's a problem of, um, of self-organizing maps. The, the initial idea, there are virtually I don't know, hundreds of variations and extensions to any method we talk about. Any method that we cover in the lecture is the initial idea. So we don't talk about usually about the extensions and version 10 and version 20. Some of them we will cover in the, in the tutorial. OK. So we want to put SOM aside. We will come back to this part. I just wanted to freak you out a little bit. Um, we get to that in two weeks. And then we go deep. And then we try to understand every bits of it. Good.
So for us, we, we want to leave clustering and go toward another topic, which is for us classification. Oh, this is a big one. This is a huge one. And the hypothesis of this one is intelligence is to distinguish things. That's it. That's intelligence. So it says, you go back to your feature domain. This is your feature one. This is your feature two. Again, we stick with the two-dimensional case uh, to just be more convenient. And then we have some data points. And I'm drawing them differently because we assume we know, but the algorithm doesn't know what is what. So let's have something simple like that. And then you run something. And we said, if you can separate them, so if you can draw a line and you separate the circles from the triangles, then this is classification. So you find a line, basically, which is wx plus b, if I write it in a general form. So you, write a, you find a line that can separate your, this object from this object. Doesn't matter what they are. The circle and triangle is just for visualization. They don't mean anything, and the algorithm doesn't know what is circle, what is triangle, no idea. So, so we just get some numbers, like the car example with the horsepower and maximum speed. You just get some numbers, and then the algorithm has to find this line. <clears throat> we have a large number of techniques that do that. Neural networks do that. Classification at the moment is the most successful application of artificial neural networks. And we will see they do this very, in a very sophisticated way. Very sophisticated. So, but what is the problem? The problem is, okay, you do this, I can, I can separate them like this. Would that be also okay? Yeah, sure. Or I could do this. Is that okay? Yeah. You're still correct. Or I would do this. 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 So every time that you train a neural network, we'll give you one of those lines. OK, so what's bad about that? Well, the question is, is there a perfect in mathematically expressed optimal line. Is there a perfect line that suppress them? I don't want just every time that you give me a line. Is there a perfect one? That you say, if you choose this one, and optimal means this, when you get this line and you go into practice, and another circle appears, you are still correct generalization. So you learn one line to separate dogs from cats, and then now you go in the reality, and you get a Shih Tzu. Can you say it's a dog? Yeah. OK, you get a Shiba Inu. Can you say it's a dog? Well, we don't, we don't know many Shiba Inu. So can you do that? So suddenly, OK, then I, can, I, have, a, I have a triangle here. And suddenly, I get a triangle here. If it, the line that you learn somehow, this happens, this line is not perfect, is not optimal, which means you cannot generalize properly. So how do we do that? Well, we want to start with the best classifier we have before we get to the ones that need a lot of training. So, and of course, that best classifier is support vector machine. OK. So we want to we talk about support vector machines, or SVMs, or SVM. So support vector machines went after the problem 
OK, so you get, you get something. You get your feature space of feature 1 and feature 2. And there is your circles. And there are your triangles. And they want to, the support vector machines want to find two lines. So they want to find the, the, perfect, the perfect line. And the perfect line is in the middle of the boundary that actually separates these two lines. So you have some of the some of the circles that are on the line on this side, and you have some of the triangles that are on the line on this side. So these this ones that are on the lines are support vectors. So this is a support vector, and of course this is a support vector. Why we call it a vector? Well, it has two values. It's a vector. Usually it has more than two values, several hundred. So support vectors are the ones that we define the margin. So this is the margin, the margin between the two classes. And for the first time, we approached this problem and said, OK, can I find, because this line can change. As I indicated there, this line can be like this, can be like this, can be like this. I can virtually draw thousands of those lines. And for each one of them, I get also two lines that go through the support vectors. And then I draw one in the middle to so say, OK, this is the middle. Nobody should be here. So nobody should be here. Nobody should be here. And of course, that gap, that margin, if it is maximized, you can keep things separate. And you are relatively safe, as long as the god of complexity let us be safe, you are safe to not violate the classification rule for new unseen data. So we want to maximize this margin. So as support vector machines belong to the class of margin maximization. How can I maximize this margin? How can I find the line not just any line, just the line that gives me this as a maximum. Because if I draw this line, the middle one, a little bit 10 degrees to the left, this cannot be maximum. It becomes, it shrinks. So can I find that? Well, people said we have neural networks, they do that. Well, but neural networks like SOM, every time that I run it, I get a different solution. Yeah, but usually it's a good solution, I know. But can you guarantee that's an optimal solution? No, sorry, I can't. OK, I want a guarantee. OK, well, we can work on it. It will not be that easy. So this line, generally for us, is again Wx plus b. So this is the, this is the line in 2D and is, of course, a hyperplane in ND. So if I go dimension 100, I still have a plane. So it will not be a surface or curvature. It will be a plane. And things get really complicated there. OK, so we want to do that. How do, we, how do we do this? So we have to make some assumption that, for example, if I, if I extend this, so my drawing may not be really uh, if, I, if, I sum, if this has certain characteristic, if the weight has certain characteristic, for example, if this is the weight, sorry, if this is that weight vector, and the weight is perpendicular to the middle line, So I, from the beginning, I work, okay, so I'm working with vectors. I will look at dot products. Two vectors, orthogonal, maximum difference, product zero. I want the middle line to be the base. Everything is, is zero. And then I want to say, OK, I have two cases. Either Wx plus b is greater than zero, 
or wx plus b is smaller than zero. I could say that, right? So I can say either things are positive or they are negative, measured from the center. The example of SVM is interesting because in contrast to neural networks that we say, OK, I have some processing units. They are capable just to throw the data at them. They will figure it out. And after they figure it out and we get 99% accuracy, and somebody asks us, how do you do that? We sit down and say, hmm, I don't know. So SVM is different. SVM, from the beginning, we are designing the intelligence, step by step. And that's why this took 30 years. And now we want to cover it in 30 minutes. It will be tough, because we have to skip some details. But that's basically it. I want to find a line. But that line is not, is not crossing any of the objects. It's in the middle of the two lines that is crossing the objects. And those two lines are containing support vectors. They go through some of the instances of the data, but not the middle line. The middle line is the baseline is 0. And for that to be 0, I need an orthogonal vector here. So OK, this guy is loving mathematics. So what? OK. Well, we can come up with some assumptions. So let, let's we need some sort of assumption, because otherwise we cannot do this. Uh, our classes belong to, this, to the set positive and negative. So I will entirely focus on a binary classification, yes or no? Yes or no? Is it, is it a circle or is it a triangle? If you add squares there, I cannot do anything. So if you have three classes, I cannot help you. Well, but that would be quite limited. I know, but let me get started. Let, let's establish something for binary for two classes. If you're lucky, we can extend to three classes, four classes, five classes. But two classes is easy. Binary classification is easy. Nothing is easy, but compared to multi-class, it's easy. So how can I do that? Now, the question is this. If I formulate the problem like this, again, you have your features. And uh, let's say this is, let me draw it this way. And I have my support vectors. So here I have. Negative here, I have plus. I have plus, of course, all over the place here. And I have negative here all over the place. So, and again, everything from middle line in that direction is negative. Everything in that direction is positive. So I could actually say, you know what? X, uh, uh, X, uh, w times x positive plus b should be greater or equal 1. And wx negative plus b should be less equal minus 1. For why I'm doing this? Why well, this is 0. The middle line is 0. And from there, well, I have binary classification plus minus. I, I could do plus minus 100, but that's not very convenient. I, I will keep it simple. Unity is always good, just 1. So and now, of course, let me see, how can I do this? This is your w that is perpendicular to orthogonal to the middle line. We don't know, we don't know how big, how long the w is. I don't know the values. This is just the direction. I have to figure out the values. That's the learning part. So I don't know, will it come to here, or here, or here, or here? I don't know. But all I know, it has to be orthogonal for me to be 0 on the middle line. Why? I need a baseline. And here, there's nothing going on. And then the classification starts when I reach the support vectors and the lines that separate them parallel to the middle line. OK. Now, what is the task? The task is. Now you get, you get 
you get an unknown you get an unknown vector. I don't know where that is, right? So this could go anywhere. This could go up. I don't know where that is. So how do I how do I how do I say that u, the vector u, is positive or negative? That's the classification, right? So don't look at this in the two dimension. Look at it at 100 dimensions. We are not seeing that the algorithm is operating on it. It has to calculate some stuff that says, oh, this is not here. If it was here, it would be negative. So this guy is actually here. So it's positive. How do you know? the features. So how do you find that plane, that separate things? OK. So we have, to, we have to do a little bit of stuff to get there, because this apparently is not that easy. So again, so w dot x positive plus b, we say it has to be greater or equal 1. w dot x negative plus b has to be so it has to be less equal minus 1. And of course, this is a dot product. Also, I am not using the bold notation to say these are vectors. So I will just write and go. From the context, we should understand, is, it, is this a scalar or is it a vector? So I'm using dot product. And the dot product is crucial. Without dot product, there is no SVM, as we will see. So it's a very crucial part of SVM. Yes? Why do we choose number one instead of some other subject number? Convenience, easiness. Anything else you use makes the com computation complicated. And proving it more complicated. It's just one and minus one. It doesn't change anything. So I'm setting it up. It's arbitrary. I'm setting it up. You could say plus 100 minus 100. But when you go ahead and you get to the part that you have to build the differentiation and do this and that, do the algebra, you get in trouble. People did that. And then they came back and said, oh, you cannot do this. Choose something simple. <laughs> so many of this is mathematical intuition. You should do it this way. Define it this way. You can define it any way you want. Can you get away with it? If you can get away with it, nobody will complain. Great. OK, do it. Plus 1, minus 1. So now. We also introduce a dummy variable, another sort of. And we say dummy variable y, y sub i, is plus 1 for all positive cases and is negative 1 for all negative cases. See, the, the, the fact that I assume that I'm dealing with binary classification, things are yes or no, black or white, makes life very easy. Now I'm introducing a dummy, and my dummies are also simple. Why I'm introducing a dummy? Why I have two sets of equations. I know I'm lazy. I cannot drag two sets of equations with me. I want to make them one. But one of them is greater or equal plus 1. One of them is less equal minus 1. It's two different things. So can I do some tricks and make them 1? Why, if you bring a dummy variable like this, you could. So this, this is just something that we can multiply and say, OK. Then y sub i times w dot x plus plus b is greater or equal 1, right? Because y sub i for plus is plus 1. So it doesn't change this. It doesn't change the direction of the inequality. And then for this one, y sub i, w dot x negative plus b minus times minus and this goes uh, other way around, also greater or equal 1. So suddenly I get both equations now are the same. So this becomes this, this becomes this, now they are the same. 
by just introducing a dummy variable which comes from nowhere. <laughs> it's not part of the data. But I could do that because I assumed I am doing binary classification, yes or no. So to keep things separate, the dummy variables that I introduce are also yes or no. And I will not go with plus 9.8 and minus 9.8. I will go with plus one, minus one. Just keep it simple. So I, now I have, I have one. I have one, which means what? Now I have y sub i times w dot x. Now I can write general x, not positive, not negative, just general x. Plus b minus 1 is greater or equal 0. OK? Now I got my first condition. So my first condition is, this is my dummy variable for class membership. This is the weights that I have to find, which is orthogonal to the middle line that perfectly separates the data. This is my data. Doesn't matter plus or minus. Doesn't matter class yes or class no. This is my bias. This is the, the position to, she, to shift uh, the plane. This is my constant, and this is greater than 0. OK. So what? Well, be patient. Yeah, it, 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 it didn't happen in two months. It took 30 years. So, and the guy had to immigrate from Moscow to New York to make it at the end of the day. So, so I don't know. It's, it must be the weather in New York, in Manhattan especially. So, OK, so now I have this. Then what? Well, what is the best classification for this? If I want to use this for classification, what is the best classification? Best classification is the largest margin. So this, this has to be maximum. I want to apply this. This is a line, right? This is a line. This is the line. This is the plane. But I cannot go after. If you find the W and you find the B, you are done. You find the line. For God's sake, we can find a line, right? So, but we are finding it in multiple dimensions, and the algorithm is in charge. We don't see anything. We cannot visualize it. That's difficult. So I want to find the line, but with one condition. Because everybody else is doing that, I want to be the special guy who gives you the guarantee and say, I give you the line. Optimal. Perfect. OK. Everybody does this. So from this point onward, you have to do something special. Something has to give to bring in intelligence. And what happened, it was late 90s, mathematics was dead in artificial intelligence. This is not an exaggeration. Mathematics as a vehicle for artificial intelligence was marginalized. And the perception was that artificial intelligence does not go with the conventional mathematics we have. And then 1995, Vapnik came with this idea. And wow, that was the victory of mathematics. Wow, you can do intelligence with linear algebra. Oh my god. OK, what did he do? Well, something really simple. So what did he do? We, le we need to maximize the margin. That's, that's the goal. That's the objective. How can I maximize the margin? So if I look again, you know, so let's say, again, these are my positives anywhere. These are my support vectors that are also positive. These are support vectors that are negative. And I have some negatives here, of course. And this is my center line. And 
I want to find out this margin. I want to find m. What is m? If I find m, I will solve that classification problem in a way that margin is maximized. So you can visualize it and you see that you find this line and margin is that much. You find this line and margin is that much. You find this line and margin is that. And you find the optimal one and margin is that much. You stick with it. So this giving me the best generalization. So, okay. So let's say we have, we have, we look at this support vector. So this is an x minus. And we look at this support vector, which is this x plus general as general example. If I build, if I look at the difference between these two vectors, right? You have not forgotten how to build the difference between two vectors. So if I build that difference and map it using the normal vector, which is the vector perpendicular orthogonal to the middle line, you get the margin. So this would be mapping, so mapping this, mapping the difference to the orthogonal one because any vector orthogonal to the middle line will do. But it has to be the normal. Okay, so x plus minus x minus, do it better, dot w, this should be the projection that gives us the width. If you don't get it, if you don't get this, please, this weekend, review linear algebra. But it has to be normal. How do I make it normal? Now somebody has to help me out. How do I make it normal? Divided by the magnitude. Now is a normal. So the difference times the normal will give you the width because that's the projection of the difference on the normal. That's it. Very simple. No magic. Has nothing to do with AI. It's, it's just regular, conventional, boring mathematics. Okay. Good. So what? Because what? Why, why he did that? Well, because you, he, he knew Vapnik, I'm talking about Vladimir Vapnik. Vapnik knew where he wanted to go. He wanted to get a formulation of the line equation that contains W in such a way to maximize the margin. So you know where you want to go, but you don't know, should I go this way or should I go that way? But you know I want to be there. Otherwise, this appears random. Why do you do this? Well, I want to bring in W as uh, something that affects the margin. Okay, which means this. Which means this is W dot X plus minus W dot X minus divided by the magnitude. Okay. Then what? So we saw that, if I bring it up, we have this. This is our actual breadth. This is what we want to classify with. And we know that this is Wx plus b, and then times this, minus 1. OK. So this will become 1 minus b plus 1 plus b. Is that clear why? So what is Wx, right? This is 1 for plus. And then this goes to the other side. Is This goes to the other side because 1 minus p, right? And the same thing for the second term, you get 1 plus p. Correct? You don't have a problem with that. Just sim I just simplify that. Nothing happened. So this becomes. 2 over the magnitude of my vector. 
seems, seems made up. The first time that you see this, it seems made up, as, as if somebody made it up. Why? Because you are saying maximize 2 over the magnitude of your vector, and you're done. Well, I can get rid of this. I don't need 2 because that's a constant. 1 over magnitude of w. I want to maximize this, which means what? Which means you want to minimize w. So minimize w. What? So that, that was in front of us all those years and nobody saw it? Yeah? So well, don't forget the orthogonality. But that aside, you minimize the vectors and you're done? What does it mean? But minimize, you can, OK, set it to 0, and you're done. No, minimize it subject to you can do this. You still want to draw a line. You cannot just minimize this for itself. It doesn't make sense. Minimize it when you are doing this. OK, now I have a constrained optimization problem. And I'm sure all my colleagues who work on optimization get happy again and smile. Because yes, AI cannot work without optimization. AI is optimization. OK, so which means what? Which means? There is not many techniques in recent times, the past 30 years, that exhibit that beauty of SVM. It's just brilliant, simple. OK, so I have to minimize this. So what is the problem? Minimize this, minimize my the magnitude of my vector subject to y sub i w dot x sub i plus b minus 1 greater or equal 0. Oh, you have some constraints. Of course, I want to draw a line. I just don't want to minimize w for sake of minimizing it because, again, just put it, put it to 0. Well, but then I cannot draw a line. I want to draw a line. OK, you have a constraint optimization problem. We have a solution for it since 150 years. Big part of advance is this. Guys who sit down, not, I, I mean general, men and women who sit down <laughs> and go back in the history of science and rediscover stuff. We had a solution for this since many, many times, many, many years. Lagrange multipliers. So you come up with your Lagrange function and you say, I want to minimize this guy. And I use the sum of this condition, which is y sub i w dot x i plus b minus 1. And I add two more things. First of all, you get your actual Lagrange multipliers alpha. So the function that I want to minimize minus the linear sum of your constraint of your condition, how to minimize. So I have to find this Lagrange multipliers. And then I'm done. This is what bothers us. Ah, you have to build the derivative. This is not nice. OK, let me add 1 over 2, power 2. What? Just like this? Oh, of course. Who can prevent me from doing this? I want to minimize this. So if I cut it in half, still I have to find the minimum. So 
If I square root it, I have to still minim find the minimum. It doesn't matter. So why do I do this? Well, the derivative of x squared is a lot friendlier than the derivative of x in some calculations. So the derivative of this would be 2 times this. This will go away. w stays. I can work with it. Intuition. Mathematical intuition. Make it simple. OK. So I have to do this. OK. Now we have to build the derivative, the partial, we have to build the partial derivatives with respect to two things. This is still a line. So this is a factor, and this is a factor. So this is my line, or plane. This is the parameter that will span my line, right? So I have to build a derivative with respect to w and with respect to b. For what w I get minimum or maximum. And for what b that I can shift my plane, I get minimum or maximum. A line. So, OK, when I build the derivative with respect to w, OK, now I get this w. OK, that's nice. That's nice. I wanted to have w. If I would just keep w, the derivative of w would be 1. The parameter that I want will disappear, so I don't want that. So minus, so this part has no w, this part has no w, this part has w, so minus the sum of alpha sub i, y sub i, the derivative of this is 1 disappears, x sub i. This has to be 0. We are building the derivatives, setting them to 0 to find optimal values. So w is the sum of alpha i, y i, x i over i. Whoa! That's a discovery. The perfect vector that I'm, orthogonal vector that I'm looking for is a linear combination of inputs, some of the inputs. Why is it a linear combination? Because I have a binary case. Of course it will be linear. I'm looking for a linear. I'm looking for a line, of course. Okay. This, this, this is too good to be true. No? Sometimes you got to believe. <laughs> Especially if you don't have powerful computers to do your calculation and you have to accept the invitation of another colleague and go to another country to just do the computations. Then we do the derivative towards uh, B. Of course, this will be here 0 minus the sum of, so here I have no b, here I have b, here I have no b. So it will be alpha sub i and times yi and derivative of b is 1, yi. And this is equal 0. So the sum of alpha sub i, y sub i, is zero. Whoa. That again seems to be made up. <laughs> Things cannot be that simple. What they are, relax, because we said that's binary classification. We made a big assumption. Binary classification that is separable linearly. That's a huge assumption to make. But still, it took us half a century to figure this out. So it was not that easy. What was the question? Uh, why do you say that this because now we are building the derivative. And then uh, we, we treat that as variables. Then the magnitude goes away. So OK, so I, now I get this too. Good. What, what does that mean? That means now we have a simplified Lagrangian function. So you would never see so much math in AI courses before 2005. 
because you, you talk about symbols and automaton and the rules and this and that, and nobody would get a word what you're talking about. It's simple linear algebra. OK, so how would that look like? So after I have the Lagrangian, and now I got two big pieces of knowledge, and I can go back and put it in, and this becomes messy. And I don't want to do this on the board. So it will be seven, eight gigantic equations that I have to write to simplify it. If I put this and this in the original formulation, and then we simplify it. So I give you, after six, seven steps, so substitute, substitute W in L in the Lagrangian function with the sum of W, I, w sub i, alpha sub i, y sub i, x sub i, we get after simplification, the simplification is not end of the walk. It's just, it just you, need, you need to, you cannot do simplify this way. You, you need to turn your this way. Because it's just a lot of sums. So you will get the Lagrangian to become the sum of alpha sub i minus half of sum of sum of, now I'm writing them uh, in form of individuals, alpha sub i, alpha sub j, y sub i, y sub j, x sub i dot x sub j. Now I'm writing it in this way because I, this are of course, scalars, and this of, of course, this is of course the dot product. And dot product plays the pivotal role in SVM. Everything is about dot product. We started with dot product, we end with dot product. So, okay. So, minimize this. You are not done yet. We have not even have a solution yet. So minimize this, for example, via quadratic optimization, which is a well-established method. So which means what? I don't do this anymore. We have the solution for this. I simplified it to become a quadratic optimization for which we have a huge library of methods that do that. This is a solved problem. If you have a quadratic optimization, this is done. So I do not continue. What was the contribution? We formulated optimal classification to become a quadratic optimization. So we took a highly complex issue. We made it so simple that can now be solved with quadratic optimization. This was something that we had said is not possible in the AI domain. And this is what Vladimir Vapnik did. So now I give this to a MATLAB function, to a Python function, to an R function, and say, solve this. Solve this, which means it gives me back the parameters that I need. And then you can start classifying. So, so how to classify after you solve it? So the sum of alpha sub i, y sub i, x sub i dot u plus b is greater or equal to zero, then you say that's positive. Otherwise, you say it's negative. And of course, this is our new data point. So x sub i 
our, our support vectors that we save, the result of learning, adjustment. And u is the unknown vector that comes along and say, oh, I have no idea. Am I positive or am I negative? Now it becomes, again, is the line. Still is the line. So we check whether this value is greater than 0 or less than 0, which is we are measuring from that middle line, which was the base for everything we defined. So you can classify. But you can only classify as yes or no. It's very simple. And you assumed is linear. Yes? Indices of just get two vectors and work with indices. I, I wanted to make the point that now we are working with the dot products between two vectors. Any vector. So you grab, you grab one support vector and you compare another one. Or you grab a support vector and new data point. So because this, this is your support vector and this is the new vector that you don't know. So OK. This, of course, only works if you have a linear problem. As, as amazing as SVM might be, SVM only works for binary linearly separable linearly separable problems. So you have two issues. Don't get too excited. You have still two problems. You can only do binary, yes and no. And you can do linearly separable problems, which means what? So again, I have my F1, the feature 1, and feature 2. And I have my circles. And I have my triangles. And I can separate them. And now, let me try to do this. Now I can separate them with my marginal maximization, margin maximization in SVM. And I give you the guarantee. There is no other line that can do a better job than mine. SVM gives you that guarantee in writing. But what happens if I have something like this? So now I have, again, some circles. And I have some rectangles. And I get something like this. Well, there is no way, there is no line that can separate this stuff. Not going to work. This is not linearly separable. What you need is a curve like this. A line doesn't work. So a problem that is not linearly separable is not good. So OK, we can live with binary. Super mighty neural networks are doing binary classification. There is no shame in binary classification. There are tough problems. Cancer, yes or no. Very serious problem. So binary does not necessarily mean simple. In the, from classification perspective, it's simple, but not necessarily. But non-linearly separable, that's a problem. Most problems in reality are something like this. We cannot separate them with a line. So we got so excited about SVM. Should we throw it away? No, the guy has worked on it for 30 years. How can we throw it away? So let's work on it. Let's make it work. So let's come up with some other tricks. We have many, many tricks to give you a better idea. So XOR is a nonlinear problem.
So if I draw XOR, so this is the XOR problem, right? 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. There is no way that you can draw a line to separate true from false, right? There is no line. So if I, if I do this line, right and wrong are together. So if I draw this line, again, there is no line. This is a linearly separable problem that we can easily understand. It's just logic. We understand that you cannot. And or, they are linearly separable. X or is not linearly separable. So how do we do this? Yeah, you know what? Sometimes it's good to make things complicated, and then you may see stuff. What does that supposed to mean? Well, if I show you to my two hands from your perspective, you see one hand. So I can have as much as distance I want between my hands, and you don't see them from your perspective. But if I rotate it toward you, you see, oh, there is plenty of space between my hands. But this rotation is a transformation that you need to apply on the data to make the differences between the boundaries visible. How do you make that? Well, so if I, if I do this, let me see how I can draw this. So if I, if this is my, let me see. Okay, let me do that, that around, other way around. So if I somehow bring up the other points up like this, this is the same. I bring a two-dimensional problem to three dimensions. Suddenly, we can actually slide something between the white and dark, black. They become separable. In two dimensions, they are not separable. I bring them in three dimensions, the, the black is in the first dimension, the white comes somehow up, rises up. Now I can slide something in between and say, boom, I can separate them with a plane, with a line. Uh, is that magic? Well, it's not magic. It's a trick. We call it a kernel trick. So what is the trick? So. Again, binary is fine. We want to see how can we find this fantastic, this beautifully designed classifier. How can we apply it on real world problems that are not linearly separable? They are difficult to separate. <clears throat> Assume that transformation of x, t of x, so this transformation, t, t of x some transformation that brings your data from low dimension to high dimension. And then suddenly things become visible. So assume that T of x is a transform that moves x to higher dimension. And making linear linear separation, making linear separation <coughs> possible. Then we have to calculate, we have to calculate T of x sub i times t of u, the unknown, right? I'm talking about here. So if there is such a transformation that enables support vector machines to separate things that are nonlinear in a linear way, then I cannot work with the dot product of the data. I have to work with the product of the transformed data. 
Okay. Whatever you say. But this would be difficult. Now this is typically, this is a typical mathematician who is talking. It says, we should do it this way, but it is hard. Okay, let's, let's do it this way. But we have to get there. If we had, now this is, this is a desire. If we had a function k, if we had a function k, which takes x sub i and x sub j, such that k of x sub i, x sub j, would be equal to of t x sub i dot t x sub j, then we won't need t. If you understand this, you are a genius. Because first time I heard this, I say, what? What, again? again? Come again? So can you do the transform without doing the transform? Why? If there is such a transform, so if you, if you have a, if, assume you have this. Take a sheet of paper, do some circles in the middle, and do some pluses around it, right? All around it. Is there a line that you can separate the circles from the pluses? Is there? No. OK. If this is a sheet of cloth, now take the corners and put it this. And this becomes separate from this. Now you can cut it. But don't cut it. So what does the transform do? Find a function that does the same without going to higher dimension. That's it. Don't go to the higher dimension. That's expensive. You already have 1,000 features. You want to go to 2,000 dimension? Who should make those calculations? And, and maybe, maybe in 1,000 and first and 1,000 and second dimension, you are not able to still separate it. So don't do the actual transform. So this, this is called. A kernel. This is one of those magical moments in the history of AI. So all we need is a kernel, which is a special function, is a kernel function k. All we need is a kernel function k. We don't need to do the transform, actually. We do not need t of x. We just get the idea. Somebody told us, OK, so if you go from here to here, you get the benefit. But going from here to here is expensive. So how can I get the benefit without going there? So we just need, need to get t of x sub i dot t of x sub j, and not t of x sub i and t of x sub j individually. I think it becomes a bit more clear. So what I need is not to get the individual transforms and then multiply them. Can you give me the transform of both of them without doing the transform individually? That's what the kernel do. So this is called 
the kernel trick. And if you go to if you go to any computer science AI machine learning conference, there are sessions after sessions that are dedicated to kernels. Because these are very special functions that have this amazing property that exhibit the benefits of a possible transformation without doing the transformation. So kernels are fundamentally functions that measure similarity. That's it. People don't want to tell you that at the beginning. I don't know why. Some people keep it, are so economical with the, that they are also economical with the truth. So just tell me, okay, so this is similarity measurement. So what are some popular ones? Popular kernels. A kernel of u and v is u dot v plus 1 raised to power n. Another kernel that most likely you know, where u and v is exponential of minus the difference between u and v over sigma. Oh, the Gaussian is also a kernel. Of course it is. It's a good one. It's, a, it's an important one. It's a powerful one. So now, which means what? We have a binary classifier that if you use the dot product of the vectors, it can separate linear things. If you want to separate nonlinear things, you have to use the dot product of the kernels, not the data itself. And what the kernel does, it gives you a measure how, I don't want to, don't take it literally, but fundamentally, in that complicated space that none of us knows, this is doing something like the KL divergence. You're looking at how close are things together, as we were looking at Tisney? So how, are things close to each other? We need to know, because I want to draw that line. I want to know, is, is this an easy job? They are far apart from each other, or they are close? So I measure the similarity. And that similarity measurement of, if you go, there's a lot of mathematics behind the kernels. They have to satisfy some conditions. We are not talking about any of that. But when we put the, the values through this, we basically work with similarity measurements instead of the values themselves. That's the implicit transform that we talk about, the transform that we don't do. Because it gives us the product of the transforms, not the, I don't know what was times what. I don't know that. I just know the product was this. OK. So we. Uh, this is for us the beginning of classification. Of course, the next level is the mighty neural networks, and we will start talking about that uh, in next uh, lecture. Yes? Which one? So here? Where? Fourth line here? Here or here? So here. OK. So to get this product, instead of getting this and this separately. To get this and this separately. Or. So we just need to get this and not this and this individual. Is that not clear? OK, we can talk about it. We talk about uh, starting with perceptrons next lecture. So um, today we have the SOM uh, tutorial that we will talk about the details and some visualization.